Beyond the Mic with Sean Dillon. We're joined on the star line by a woman who used to hear the chant, Jerry, Jerry, at work. A well-timed one-liner once got her a job. Rena's on a mission to take risks, not know a stranger, and didn't want a co-host to back out on her, so she asked her dad. Her podcast is Better Call Daddy. We welcome Rena Friedman Watts. Oh my God, that was good. I am talking to a pro. <laughs> Rena, let's go beyond the mic. How did you go from sports medicine and vocal music major at Charleston to helping mm. others as a marketing specialist? Nobody asks me that, you know. Ah, there's so much to that question. So I got into sports medicine because, yeah, beyond the mic, baby. I got into sports medicine because I, I got a singing scholarship to my first college and sports medicine was like their most popular program. And I wanted to get in with the athletes, right? So I was like, oh, I'm picking that major. I got to do clinical hours with the basketball team, the football team, the volleyball team, the crew team. That was all fun and dandy until I saw some really bad injuries. And I do not do well with blood. And I learned that. <laughs> so did you pass out? Oh, practically. Oh God. I saw this in parenting too. <laughs> oh man. I switched my major and switched schools my junior year of college, which so many people do. I knew I had met a guy. Oh, it's always a guy or it's always a girl, right? Always someone else. Yes. Yeah, so I met a guy in the sports med program at Purdue. And he was like, if you actually want to work as an athletic trainer in the pros, it's not going to be from the University of Charleston, I hate to tell you. So I ended up switching to Purdue because of that and him. And then he didn't work out and neither did that major. But I did find a radio station on campus. WBAA. Yes. And I was like, ooh, I love this medium. And I loved my time there. And I started recording the news and weather. And I also started like singing in the booth and making my own air check tapes and getting super creative and finding myself in that radio station. You live for a story. There's always a story you've either researched, discovered, or shared. How has your own story changed from 920 WBAA to today? Mm, wow, you ask amazing questions. My story, I feel like, has built upon itself. So I'm actually starting at a radio station this weekend called Cool.fm. I got that gig from having worked for other podcasters, having co-hosted a podcast, having created a podcast of my own, having been on 40 or 50 other podcaster shows, having worked in TV, all of these skills that I've been honing over the years led to that opportunity. There's always possibilities. You just have to constantly be connecting with people and figuring out what you're good at, what you're not good at, leaning into the things that you're good at, making space for the things that you're good at. If you try something and you're not enjoying it, you got to listen to that and cut it away. So I feel like my story really actually started from a very young age. My dad wanted me to work in entertainment. I always dreamed of doing that. I've taken steps to do it. I've tried many different things in the entertainment world from having been an executive assistant at the Kyoto Brothers production in LA. After having been a producer at the Jerry Springer show, I went from being an intern to an associate producer, to a producer, to back to an executive assistant, to a post-production supervisor, to an assistant editor. I have tried so many different facets of working in the entertainment industry. And now I'm going to be announcer on the new cool.fm. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Rena, you're a marketer of yourself and others. What do you get out of being on someone else's show after booking hundreds and hundreds of people on other people's shows? It's good practice to have to tell your story in different ways. And to be honest, I tried Toastmasters and wanted to get better at public speaking because actually the crowd I don't get lit up from, I get very scared of. Why? <laughs> I know. 
people don't usually think that about me. I've been asked to speak in front of small crowds and then I inch my way into like bigger crowds. And the more I do the podcasting I, and the radio announcing or these different experiences, I have become more comfortable with it. But I was very afraid. So what do I get by being on other people's shows? They Everybody asks the questions in different ways. And you learn from how other people ask questions and, and how other people help you tell your story. And I want to do that for people. There's so many people that are afraid to put themselves out there and you got to inch your way into it. I have been practicing now for years. Speaking of different, Rena, it's time for the Rocking 8. Eight random questions. Answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. There is no pressure. I love the improv of this. Maybe a little. <laughs> Best ride at Kentucky Kingdom. Oh my gosh, there's, what is it called? I think it was called like the vampire or something. Many, many loops. Rena, tell me the truth. Have you ever beaten your father at chess? Never. (laughs) And I probably never will, but my oldest son is studying with a chess master. So I hope he does it for me. What's your typical Starbucks order? My favorite order at Starbucks is a cinnamon dolce. When I'm going to Starbucks, I'm going all out. When you were pregnant, what was the most disgusting combo you ate? Oh man. I was thinking of what I liked, but it might sound disgusting to other people. Oh my gosh, I couldn't get enough of chocolate milk. And then my husband made like this miso soup. So that probably does sound pretty disgusting, but I wanted both of those things together. Best thing about your husband, Will? Um, My best thing about my husband is that he fills in my gaps. He's good at things that I can't do. All the gaps? (laughs) All of them. Which famous person would you love to have as a business partner? I have to say, I would probably go back to my roots of Jerry Springer. I mean, that guy can say yes to what he wants and no to what he doesn't want. And he tells it like it is. And I think that it's honestly admirable that he's reached the level of success where he can just tell it like it is. He really can be himself. And that makes a good business partner. And he doesn't care what people think. Exactly. He's got that kind of money. Have you ever invented a fairly unique drink or meal combo? Well, my first real job was Dairy Queen. And I have to say, I did combine a lot of the ingredients in the blizzards. And so M&Ms actually go very well with butterscotch. Tasty. I used to order that. Rena, what's the most sentimental photo you have of you and of your dad? Oh, that's so sweet. I do love a photo where I decorated my dad and the dog in stickers and ribbons. God bless a dad who will let you do that. And I, I, that's the first picture that came to mind. My Sheltie Collie covered in stickers, twinning with my dad. If you're enjoying these conversations, please check out another Beyond the Mic episode to find more actors, artists, and people you need to know. We'd also appreciate a like and subscribe on the Good Pods app. The podcast is Better Call Daddy. Rena Friedman Watts joins us beyond the mic. And Rena, it's time for the back half. Let's talk about Better Call Daddy. What makes your podcast different than everybody else's? The number one daddy-daughter podcast out there. My dad is a character. He always wanted his own show. And I think what makes it great is that we have this relationship that can't be duplicated. And he feels comfortable with me. I feel comfortable with him. And that's what you need out of a co-host. That's what you need out of an encourager. That's what you need out of a business partner, like somebody that brings out the best in you. He has always taught me to reach for the stars. He's always made me feel like there's nothing that I can't do. And I wanted to share that. Growing up, Rena, what did you think you were going to be? (laughs) I wrote a book in kindergarten saying that I wanted to move to Hollywood. What's really funny about that is the book was called, I think, Catherine, because I wanted to be blonde and blue eyed and like Hollywood material, but I was living in a mansion in Hollywood in kindergarten. And I actually did end up moving to Hollywood and working in entertainment and having that chapter in my 20s, which I would not trade. Now, how has your family reinvigorated who you are and how you've changed your identity from Hollywood to helping? Well, I just celebrated my daughter's bat mitzvah. It was so, so meaningful. And 
as a kid, I wasn't always actually proud of being Jewish. I grew up Jewish in Kentucky, which I thought was weird. And a lot of people were like, are you Hispanic? Are you Italian? Are you Bohemian? I make, I make jokes about it now, but the more you lean into what you are and, and stop denying it, I've known my great grandparents. I've known my grandparents. I've known my parents because when you grow up in Kentucky, they have you young. And I feel like I've embraced that now and I see beauty in it. And I hope that one day my kids can too. Rena, I could ask you about any topic. You'd have a story, relationships, miscarriages, celebrities, family, marketing, entrepreneurship, parenting, sports, politics, self-improvement, careers, and LinkedIn. You'd have a story to tell. What are you afraid of? Oh, that is such a good one. I mean, to be honest, I am still afraid to get on a large stage with a big crowd of people. That does still scare me. Biggest crowd that I've ever gotten in front of. And I have to say it was one of my most proudest moments and I didn't want to do it, but my parents, it was like uh, encouraged it or tried to get me to do it. I sang the Star Spangled Banner at the University of Charleston in front of the basketball team. And my mom was standing up there with one of those big VHS cameras and embarrassed me to death. (laughs) And my little sister stood up there and held my hand. And then after I did it, one of the basketball players came up to me. I'll never forget this. And he said, I thought I heard angels singing. And so that made it all okay. Everyone has challenges in their lives. Adversity makes most of us stronger. How has your will been tested? And why do you believe you are where you are today and now? Oh, man. I would say my biggest adversity that I've had as an entrepreneur is trusting people that I shouldn't. Why? And I fall into the trap again and again of like, not having solid contracts in place and people saying that they're going to pay me and then they don't. I've been burned that way a couple of times and I still try to see the good in people and enter into relationships. And I I think really the best policy there is just to get paid up front with new customers. I I am going to have to start doing that. (laughs) Your belief in a handshake agreement is amazing. I mean, my dad is, he's an entrepreneur. His parents were entrepreneurs. They did handshake agreements back in the day, but he's been burned too. I think that has really uh, been tough for me. And then another vulnerable point, which I don't really talk about a lot, but I really struggled with body image stuff. Yeah, I really don't talk about it so much, but... I had an eating disorder in college and God, I look back at myself when I thought that I was fat and I wasn't, I just would see somebody totally different in the mirror. I think now that I'm a mom and I don't want my kids to feel the way that I felt, I really try not to tell them not to eat the donut or not to eat the cake, you know? Not to, I want them to live life. Yeah. You wanted to seek validation. Rena, are you happy with the way you are today? Oh, that's such a good question. I I always feel like I'm seeking outside validation. But part of doing this podcast is being able to interview people who are successful, that have overcome things, and that I can find common ground with. It really has helped me so much. I feel like the podcast has kind of been like therapy, but cheaper. (laughs) Well, you talked about being betrayed by business partners. How has betrayal changed you? I mean, you may not get back what you give. That's, that's a really good one. I don't ask for other people to help me enough. Why? Because of betrayal. It's funny too, even in the workplace, even at working for Springer, like I've always been that type of person that's like, I'll do it all, but that leads to burnout and you can't do it all, especially as a mom of four, an entrepreneur, a wife, 
a granddaughter, a daughter. There's a lot of hats that I wear. Burnout is important to avoid, but when you have such high expectations, it's hard to give a project or task to someone else who can't deliver to the level you expect. It's true. I have to say, people that give you room to breathe and to make mistakes and give you feedback and let you blossom, shout out to David Moss at cool.fm because he is like that. I am so glad to be a part of this new team because he is totally giving me the space to make a couple flubs and to find my own voice and to let me be myself and not overcorrect, but let me course correct. And that is what I'm trying to do in parenting even. Rena, who portrayed you last and how have you forgiven them? Woo! Well, I even put this on my Twitter, but I do, I am working on giving people the benefit of the doubt until they prove otherwise, right? Everybody's busy. Everybody has a lot of balls in the air, but I did recently do some work for someone who has not paid me. And so I'm hoping that he will. Rena Friedman Watts joins us from Better Call Daddy podcast. Rena, you have a goal of helping others, whether it's teens to make better college decisions, help entrepreneurs, or helping seniors in communities. Where did your servant's heart come from? Definitely my dad. Definitely, 100% from him. I mean, I've watched him take care of his father. I've watched him take care of his mother. He's currently doing that. He does that to to the degree that I haven't seen anyone else do it. I mean, what a loyal soldier. He also took care of employees that worked for him, has kept up relationships for decades. He's given people second chances out of prison that other people wouldn't even give work to. (sighs) He's such a good role model. That again is why I wanted to do the Better Call Daddy show because he can give advice to entrepreneurs. He can fill in if you need encouragement. Or he can just reflect upon your story that you want to share and add something witty to it. How did the pandemic quarantine change you as a mom, a wife, an entrepreneur? Yeah, I will say I had a baby in 2019 and he was a preemie born seven weeks early. And it's funny because I got cast for the show called Windy City Nanny And she interviewed me like mid postpartum. I mean, it was a big transition going from working and having career momentum to my husband having to tell his boss that I'm pregnant, I'm having a baby right now, and he's got to be, he's got to go to the hospital. (laughs) He didn't even tell his boss yet that I was having the baby until I called him from the hospital. It was a whirlwind. And then she convinced me that I could still have it all. With my other kids, I didn't work full-time. I worked part-time at most. And I I really didn't even start working part-time until they were in preschool. So we decided to mix things up when I was 39 and have another one. I worked for about eight months and then the pandemic started happening and I didn't any longer feel comfortable bringing a nanny into my house because I just didn't want to introduce that into our little environment. So how it changed was my baby got more attention with his parents than my other three kids had gotten. He was raised essentially during a pandemic and wanted mommy and daddy. And I started feeling bad even about not giving my other kids that kind of love and attention. I just spoke with a guy today. We have 18 summers with our kids. That's it. 18 summers. Are you making that time meaningful? Are you checking in with your kids? Do you know what's happening at school? How are you as a parent? What do kids want most from you? Your time. They don't care about gifts. They want your time. They want you to work less. They want you to know about their day. And so I think the pandemic gave me that. And so my kids, the shift was my kids became more important than my work for the first time ever because I had four of them at home and it wasn't a two week break. It was a long time. And then too, I was like, my eight and 10 year old need to still know how to read and write. 
So I hired a tutor. I had never done that. I was like, okay, if they can stay up on their reading and writing, that's good. And I needed to find things for my kids because they couldn't do activities anymore. It was, it was a big shift. So would you consider the best gift you've ever given your kids is your time? Yeah, I would. And I still feel like I'm failing there. I still feel like a bad parent and I pick them up every single day. And I've done the corporate thing. I've actually left a corporate job because I had trouble balancing the nanny and, and the train. But I wanted to be the one to pick up my kids from school. I wanted to be the one to hear about their day, even if the whole day that they're at school, I'm working. Rena producing Jerry Springer, working with MTV, VH1, Nanny 911, Judge Alex, Hot Bench, and more. How did those times feed your soul? Oh, great question. I think... It really goes alongside what I'm doing with the podcast is that I loved finding the common ground with people and becoming friends with them enough for them to go on those shows or those experiences and tell their story. Bouncing from job to job during those early years after college, did those jobs and those experiences strip away your humanity or add to it? Mm. You know, in the beginning, I didn't even think about humanity at all. Why? Because I had a very small, limited worldview, and it was much more ego-driven. I wanted to work in entertainment. I wanted to make money. I wanted my name in the credits. But then it's like after you get your name in the credits a whole bunch, then you start caring about the content. And it loses value. It loses value. It feels empty. And that's truthfully why I went on a spiritual journey at about 25. I went on a singles trip to Israel (laughs) because I was like, wow, I've had my name in the credits and worked on all these cool shows. Like you said, E and VH1 and gotten to travel and had all of these amazing opportunities. And I still felt empty. I wanted something more. Rena Friedman Watts from the Better Call Daddy podcast joins us beyond the mic. Rena, how did your trip to Israel change the way you look at work and the balance between work, family, and yourself? That's such a great question. So after that trip, I was on my third season of Nanny 911. And until that trip, I was all the time available. And truthfully, I do believe that many jobs in Hollywood require that. But I had worked on the show from pilot to season three And luckily at that point, I very much understood the role, but I started, I started unplugging third season of Nanny 911. I started turning off my phone on Friday night and being unavailable for 25 hours a week and keeping the Sabbath in that way. And oh my God, in the beginning, it was so bad. Like I would turn on my phone and people are like, the first message was like, I can't reach you. Your phone's off, you know? And then it was like the problems worked themselves out. I realize that the world does not come out of orbit if you are not available for 25 hours. And you know what? I became addicted to that. I was like, I am going to unplug one day a week forever. And I have kept that up for 16 years. So that was a major shift. Rena, what three things do you think of most every day? Hmm. I actually really very much care about my podcast. (laughs) it's like my work of art. It's my creative outlet. I do think like, I think about my podcast every day. I also think about my kids and how I can make things easier for them and, you know, how I can make the house better. I should think about how to be a better wife. My husband is such a blessing and, I, I wouldn't want to have kids or this life with anybody else. So I guess I do think about him. Poor too. <laughs> Will. Your first tweet Christmas Eve 2008 was, quote, searching Twitter, unquote. Did you find what you were searching for? Oh, that's so great. Wow. You are an amazing researcher. I am just loving these questions that no one else asked me. Here's the thing. I did not really even get active on Twitter, I feel like, until like like the last six months. And... What's interesting is I feel like I've gotten more traction there recently than on any other platform. I don't know if Twitter has changed. 
or maybe I've learned how to use it better, but I love the audio spaces. I love just kind of documenting my life. And if I'm listening to a podcast and something makes me stop and then I turn that into either a poll or a quote or, you know, a way that my audience can respond to me. So I use Twitter as kind of a blog, just like I do LinkedIn, just like I do Facebook. And I do feel like I I found you there. I do feel like I'm starting to find my tribe on Twitter. I have found what I'm searching for. What was the best movie you used to see in Louisville, Kentucky back in 2009 for six bucks? I mean, you used to go to the National Amusements, Showcase Cinema, Stonebrook, and Louisville. Bargain Tuesdays. How did you find that? Research, my friend. I go, well, wow. you know, beyond. Majorly beyond the mic. Know. That was such a fun stomping ground in Louisville. I think it even closed down. Bardstown Road, Showcase Cinema. I mean, my favorite movie of all time, and this will tell you the era that I grew up in, was Dirty Dancing. Do you put baby in the corner? I don't put baby in the corner. Nobody puts baby in the corner. (laughs) Rena Friedman Watts from the Better Call Daddy podcast joins us beyond the mic. Rena, what's your biggest success? And you can't talk about your kids. I was going to say three natural childbirths, but I will (laughs) transition that into, I got accepted into a music program on my second try. So the first time I got rejected and then my dad taught me how to turn a no into a yes. He went to the head of the music department and was like, look, my daughter might start from behind, but she finishes in the front. She's kind of like an outside horse. (laughs) He compared me to a derby horse and that worked in Kentucky. I will say that not getting accepted my first try and then staying with that program for four years takes a whole lot of swallowing your pride because I was surrounded by incredible talent. I went to school with Nicole Scherzinger, Sarah Gettelfinger, who made it to Broadway. The people that were in the program with me, a lot of them are incredibly successful today. And I never felt like I had been accepted since I was rejected the first try. And so... I will say that my biggest success was making it through that program and then getting a couple offers for a music scholarship to college. So why do you think you've succeeded in life? Because I get back up. I I really think that there have been, there have been many instances of me being told no or getting rejected or, not getting an opportunity on the first time, even actually working in court TV. I I think I was a post-production supervisor on a couple different shows. And then I got flown out to Texas. They were starting Judge Alex in Texas and they put me up in a suite and then they gave me a tape and they told me to make a string out of how I would edit it. And I never had to do that as a post-production supervisor on the other shows that I was a post-production supervisor on. I just had to make sure that all the specs were met that were already mapped out. And so when they asked me to edit it, oh my God, I literally was in panic mode. I was like, I didn't get it. I stayed up the whole night trying and I was just like, this is awful. And what's interesting is we moved from LA back to my hometown of Kentucky. And then I saw on Craigslist and the TV and film section that they were looking for a researcher on the same show that had moved from Texas to California. And so I ended up taking a job as a researcher and I did that while my kids were in preschool where I would go to the courthouse, go through all the small claims cases, pick the good stories, upload them. And I got really good at it. Like I actually loved that I got in with all the clerks and I would call them and find out when they had a good stack of cases. And I'd find out if other shows had already been there and when was the best day to come. And it was like a game for me. And I felt like I had my foot back in the entertainment industry. So I did that, but it was the same show that I got rejected for the post-production supervisor role. It's just interesting. Like if you don't, totally throw away the show that it can come back around in a different way and that you can get back in, you know, just circling back with people or trying a different angle. I've, I've been successful in that way. Rena, what's the one story that means the most to you? Hmm. 
I do feel really lucky that my mom had me at such a young age because I have known five of the six of my great grandparents. I've known all four of my grandparents and I've gotten to have special relationships with them. And that has really shaped me today. My dad's mom is 94. I can't even tell you how many times I've traveled to see her. It's been a lot. And we can't have those two, three hour conversations anymore, but I literally take my children there just to hold her hand just so she knows that she's loved because she's shown me so much love throughout my life. That's why my dad is who he is because of her. She really goes deep. And I feel one of the hardest relationships in my life, honestly, is my mom because she had me super young. And I don't really talk about this a lot, but I think that there was some resentment there. And even though our relationship isn't, where I would want it to be, my grandmother, my dad's mom kind of filled in. And I spent every weekend at her house until about fifth grade sleeping on a little mattress in her bedroom. Like they had a special little bed for me. And I could literally walk to my grandparents' house from my parents' house in Kentucky. So I feel fortunate that even though they got married young and They struggled a bit in the beginning. I was able to know my grandparents and my great-grandparents. How has the relationship with your mom changed and evolved from resentment to now? Well, I will say I had a very special moment with my mom this past weekend because my daughter had her bat mitzvah and my dad and my sister were in from out of town and my husband was walking the three-year-old after our large lunch meal that we all had together with about, I don't know, 17 people or something. And it was too cold. I didn't want to go and my mom didn't want to go. And so just the two of us sat back together and she said, even though you're asking me uncomfortable questions, I'm glad that we're like at least talking to each other. And her just saying that like literally made me want to cry. Like she wants to have a closer relationship with me. She just doesn't know how. She's never known how. And I've accepted that. It's time for one big question. With Rena Friedman Watts from the Better Call Daddy podcast, Beyond the Mic, quote, my dad has been my guiding force my whole life. There's nothing he doesn't know. And I want to share that with the world, unquote. How do you prepare for a day when your dad isn't on this earth anymore? You know, I've actually interviewed many people on my podcast now that have been through that. And when I hear them tell their stories about how much they miss their dad and they relate to me about how much I love my dad, I actually feel like this time capsule that I've created will help with that because I'll have so many memories and so many conversations and a guidebook. It may not be a journal, but it's something that we created together that I'll always cherish. And I hope my kids will cherish too. Her first concert was Michael Jackson. Love watching 24 and enjoys the cinema dolce. Check out the Better Call Daddy podcast wherever you find podcasts. Rena Friedman Watts, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Sean, I am truly mind blown by your researching and your interviewing abilities. This has been absolutely one of my favorite interviews. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, is Beyond the Mic. 